So Vax, can uh, you've already taken the offer? Right? You're good. Right, so Vax chapter one. one. Welcoming those who might be coming for the first time, or those who have not been coming for a long time, you've come back, welcome. Welcome. We welcome you. Can we all stand for the reading of God's Word? Book of Acts, chapter 2. We read from verse 40 to verse 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 40 to 47. This is the word of the Lord, so let us listen. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Verse 41. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day they were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and they were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those <coughs> who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Also remembering um, Debo Ho and our Gam who have traveled or not around us, so just keep them in prayer. Do we have any other excuse? Yes. How can you sick? Okay, she's not feeling well. Mrs. Kanyako's sister, Lebu's sister, has been hospitalized this past week. So I think Utato and Lebu are attending to, to them. They had quite a situation that happened at home in the East Rand this past week. So let's remember them in prayer as well. Sis Gwena is also not feeling well. Okay. Sis Gwena is not well. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Good to see you. Any other um, apologies? Let's pray. And so Lord, we thank you for the integrity of your word. We thank you for caring for your people. We thank you that you are continually strengthening us to fulfill your will in different ways. Um, Lord, we want to lift up the Mamabolos, we want to lift up the Nyanis who have traveled away and pray for safe journeys. We pray for a time of rest, time of recuperation as they rest and they um, focus on you, Lord. Um, we can so much focus on doing and doing and forget to be here, forget to rest in you, Lord. So we pray that they may have a time of refreshment, that they may come back ready to, to keep serving you, to keep loving you, and to keep on um, being a blessing to your body. We pray for Chauhelo, who's not feeling well, she hasn't been well in some time, giving offense as well, um, she's hospitalized as well, asking that Lord may your hand be upon us, be child's and um, the rest of the kids, we are really asking for your intervention. Um, you said in your word that if we call upon you, you will answer us. So we call upon you to have mercy upon them. Lord, they have 
been such a blessing as a family, just trying to live your will and serve you. And Lord, may you be compassionate towards them. May you show yourself strong. May you show, Father, your grace. May you show your hand of healing upon them. That there may be testimony of your healing hand. Thank you for Sisquena who has not been well, but Siapoma goes for this morning. She's with us here today. And she was able to wake up and make it uh, to be here. Lord, we pray for you and other people who are here, who might be physically here, but emotionally they might not be here. They might be scarred, they might be breaking, they might be saying, this is the last time, I don't know if I'm going to make it tomorrow. I pray for those people that your gospel and your word will take them up and let them know that they can make it another day. May you give hope to the hopeless this morning. Your word declares that if there's anyone who's sick, they must call upon the elders of the church and they shall lay hands upon them. And the prayer of the righteous man shall be able to heal them. So Lord, we pray. We pray, Father. We pray that you may just do something and ensure yourself by your spirit in this place. We see what you're doing in your word in the early church and we desire that. We desire to see you revival. We desire to see you, Lord, move in our, in our church, but not just our church. You're in our city, in our community. We want to see churches, gospel, preaching churches filled up with believers. Um, we want to see people coming to faith. We want to see revival. We want to see hearts turning to King Jesus and surrendering their life, Lord. So we pray for that. We pray for what we see happen in Pentecost where the Holy Spirit just began to take over and it changed the atmosphere, it changed everything. We desire to see that, Lord, but we also know that we can't bring about revival. We don't have the power to. We can just ask you and keep on pleading with you. And your word declares that if we are asking, Lord, for bread, you will not give us a snake. That you'll be able to give us all your Holy Spirit. You'll be able to, to fill us and give us what it is that we need. And we need you, Lord. We really need you to come through. We have tried. We have done it our way. But Lord, we declare now that it is only you that can save. It's only you that can transform. It's only you that can do what we can do. Our family members trapped in drug addiction. Trapped in enslaved in so many things, um, addicted to so many things, that we look at them and we we feel so helpless. Um, try to help out with financially, but it doesn't work. We try to talk, but it doesn't work. Lord, we pray for your spirit to break forth, to break through, and to do what we cannot do in the lives of people who don't know you. We also know that revival must begin in the church. So, Sadala, it's not kind of say as we are sitting here, but you might revive our own hearts. We ourselves might experience the revival that we're praying for. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And you may be seated. May God, may God do something in our lives, in our communities. We are desperately longing for the Spirit of God to transform our communities. I came in here and I was looking at the bottles of alcohol outside our premises in the morning. They had an event here yesterday and just looking at how addicted, how enslaved as a black community we are to alcohol, to entertainment, to things that really don't matter, it breaks my heart. We need God to move in our community and change hearts. Can you fix the mic? Something is wrong here. 
All right. We are in the book of Acts. We're in the book of Acts. And we've been, we've been looking at, at this book. And as I said, we're going to be here for the next couple of weeks as we open up what this book is all about. We're taking it slow. We are taking it verse by verse. We're taking it verse by verse. And we're looking at what Acts has to teach us uh, today. To a lot of people, the, the word church has become a swear word. How come Shina just that word Eli Karek is old bank? Just by mentioning that word, it's as if you have sworn to other people. It's a swear word to them. I know people who have stopped coming. I know people who have stopped coming to church because of the treatment that they got from church. I was speaking to someone even just this past day, last night, who was saying to us that their mother because of what she experienced in church growing up. She has totally given up on church. She will not come. As soon as you mention church, it's a swear word. And I think a large part of it is that we don't know what church is. We don't know. When I say we, I'm including we as leaders as well. We ourselves do not know what church is. We mix the biblical understanding of church with the mistakes of people and we've lumped the whole thing in one to the extent where anything can be a church now. Anything is, is just anything goes. We don't know what it means to be the church. It begs the question, how do you know if a gathering is a true church or not? How do you know if a gathering is a church or a true church? Have you ever thought about that question? There's so many places where people are gathered and they say they are having church. But how do you know? How do we know? Biblically, are the signs, are the marks, are the things that we can look and see and say that truly, yes, this is happening, this is happening, therefore that is the church. With the book of Acts, looking at how God has accomplished his mission, in chapter 1, you remember what Jesus said to the disciples or to those who were gathered, the 120, he said, I will give you power. I will give you authority and the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You shall be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria. You shall be my witnesses at the remotest part of the earth. So right now, guess where we are? In the book of Acts, we are in Jerusalem. Amen. So what Jesus said to them in Acts chapter 1 is literally happening. It's happening in chapter 1. They are still in Jerusalem. And they are experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. And they are seeing the advance of the gospel. So we're still in Jerusalem. We're going to get to the gospel when it gets to Samaria. When it gets to the ends of the world. So the major shift that happened at Pentecost. You saw that the believers were filled with what? They were filled with? The Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Because Jesus said he will empower them, right? So they were not just going to go because banali vision or they want to go and conquer the world. They had to wait for the feeling and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? amen. Because if you're going to go and preach this message, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. You need the leading and the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter was there as you saw that they started speaking in other tongues and people thought that they were drunk. And as they are standing there, Peter stands up 
and he begins to explain the message for you guys. These guys are not drunk. And it is nine o'clock in the morning. But this was the fulfillment of what the prophets had said in the Old Testament that this was going to happen. What was going to happen? That God was going to fill everyone with the Holy Spirit. Not just the Jew, but even the Greek, but even the Libyan, the Egyptian, all the people around the world were in Jerusalem and they were experiencing the feeling of the Holy Spirit. So he preaches and there were people that got saved in Jerusalem. The first mega church was in Jerusalem. The group of believers were able to constitute what we call a church. They constitute what we call a church. Remember, Jesus is no longer in the world, right? But he was going to work through these believers now. Now that he's ascended, now that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, these believers that were filled with the Holy Spirit were going to be God's agency in continuing the mission of God here on earth. Amen. So he has left his people to continue the mission. And if the mission of getting the gospel to the ends of the world was going to happen, it must happen through believers. Amen. It's mission impossible, but they had the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. They were not going to do it alone. So it becomes crucial to be able to identify the true church so that we can know who's really part of our team. Right? Who's really part of our team? Who's really part of the church? It becomes really important for us to identify the church. Some people, when you go to the stadium, they try to trick you. They sit on the sundown side, but they're wearing a cheese shirt. I don't know why people do that. And you see that they've tricked you. When they've scored against us sundowns, you see them, it's like, why are you happy? But you see that, no, this one is not part of our team. This one, he's just come here as an imposter. So as believers, we need to know who wears the Christian jersey, right? Who's part of the church? How do we even get to identify uh, the church? So we're going to look at some signs. Signs that will help us to identify the true church. Signs that will help us to identify the true church. Before we look at the first sign, let's look at, or we look at what they were doing, or what will identify the church. Let's look at who they were. Let's look at who they were. Let's read again from chapter 2, after Peter preached. Look, look at chapter 2. Look at their response after Peter preached the message. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 36. But from verse 37, look at their response. Now, when they heard this, what did they hear? They heard that the same Jesus that they had crucified, the same Jesus that they had denied was the Son of God. Now they are hearing that he has ascended, that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that the same Jesus was the one who has poured out the Spirit. He's the same one that they had killed. They are now hearing this. It says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. Did you see that? And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? In other words, are we... Are we lost here because we killed him and, and we thought that he's just another man but we now realize he's the son of God he has poured out his spirit what are we gonna do are we what's happening now what's the next plan Peter said repent each and of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. 
as many as the Lord God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received this word, Amen? Those who received the preaching of the word, those who were convicted and they received the word were baptized and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. Did you see that? And what happens after that? They were continually, can you say continually? <laughs> devoting themselves to apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. What it is that you pick up from there? You pick up that from the preaching of the word, and from what God had done in their heart, it transformed not just one part of their life, but it transformed everything about them. It transformed them so much that it changed their identity. It changed their whole lives. It didn't just improve a few things and just tweak a few things here and there, but their whole lives were changed. You see the response here. You see that these people were truly broken and they were truly changed. It transformed everything about them. Do you see the word continually devoting? Did you see that? Verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Many, and those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property possession, were sharing with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind. Did you see that in the temple? So the gospel transformed their whole lives to the point where Christianity was everything to them. Amen. It's not just that they were going to church, you know, as people think about Christianity or Norman. Why when Angari are getting like too much? Angari, you are just, just tone it down a bit. You know, people think that it's almost like uh, we, we're ticking a box, like, no, I think I've, I've gone three times this year. I think, man, it's my coat is sharp. That's how people think of it. That's not how these big believers were transformed. They were transformed to such an extent that the Bible says they were continually devoting themselves. So this thing was a hard thing. Look at your neighbor say, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. Their heart was transformed to the point where they wanted to conform their lives to this Jesus that they now heard that has now resurrected and was ascended on their behalf. Amen. When the gospel comes, it changes our lives, it changes our priorities, it changes our interests, it changes who we listen to, it changes who you spend time with. Amen. The gospel changes everything. It changes everything. I posted something the other day where it said something like, may your, gospel, may your friendship and the closest people that you know be gospel friendships. May the people that are closest to you, may the people that are affecting you, may the people that you spend time with, people that will transform your mind and your thinking. The true church is made of believers who are changed from the inside out. Not the other way around. It's first, the gospel changes our heart, then we begin to do. If we get the order wrong, we get the gospel wrong. Amen. Now, let's look at the stuff that they were doing. The what? Let's look at the what. Firstly, how do you identify a true church? Number one, a life of devotion to sound doctrine. A life of devotion to sound doctrine. And I'm specifically saying, I'm intentionally saying a life. Because it's not just something you do on Sundays. Amen. As you can see that they were continually giving themselves. Continually devoting themselves to this. So if you want to know a true church. 
check their devotion to doctrine, to teaching. Are they devoted to doctrine? Are the believers there devoted to sound doctrine? Look at your Bibles. I'm getting this from the Bible. Verse 41 again. So then those who had received his word were baptized. That day they were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to what? What does it say? To the what? To the apostles' teaching, number one. That's where I'm getting it from. They were devoting themselves to apostles' teaching. So we don't have apostles today. We don't have apostles today. We do not have apostles today. But we do have the teaching of the New Testament. The apostles left their teachings in the Bible. Right? Amen? Amen. Here, there, that side, they had them live. They had them. They were receiving their teaching through their, through their writings. We are also privileged to receive the, the teachings of the apostles today. This is what they were busy themselves with. Teaching and preaching. Sound doctrine. Sound teaching. The apostles teaching. You will be surprised that in the book of Acts there's a lot of preaching and teaching that's going on here. This is what actually surprised me when I started to study the book of Acts closer. Look at chapter 3. We're going to go there next week. But just as a precursor, look at chapter 3 from 11 to 26. There's a situation here where Peter and John are going to pray. They meet a lame man on the way. And then he lifts up his hand asking for alms. But Peter and John tell them that he asnaman. Silver and gold we do not have, but what we do have, we give you in the name of Jesus. Get up, stand up and walk. And the Bible says the man started to walk. Amen. So now there's amazement. There's wonder at what is happening here. Instead of focusing on themselves, what does Peter do? You don't see him starting to have a specific and a special healing ministry. You don't see him going around saying, look at me, come to me. Let me show you that I'm the greater healer than the other person. You don't see them focusing on themselves. What does Peter do? He starts to preach. He preaches the gospel. I'm not going to get deeper into it because next week we're going to be looking specifically at this miracle. But for now, look at verse 11. While he was clinging to Peter and John, while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the so-called Portugal Solomon full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people. He's seeing them that they're trying to make a big deal of him. Did you see that? But when he sees them, he says, guys, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? Did you see that? Did you see that Peter is intentionally trying to move them away from himself? He said, it's not my power that has made this man walk. And then he begins to preach the gospel and tell them about Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. Look at Acts 4. You're going to see this in this book. <coughs> Chapter 4, verse 1 to 2. As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly disturbed because they were what? What were they doing? Teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Did you see that? Chapter 5, verse 20 to 21. But during the night, the angel of the Lord opened the gates of prison 
Taking them out, he said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and they began to do what? They began to teach. Chapter 8 to 12, chapter 19 to 21, you're going to see that preaching and teaching played a major part in what the apostles were doing. Stephen Lawson says the evidence that the apostles spent time teaching and preaching is overwhelming to the point that we can argue that Acts was a record of apostolic preaching and teaching. He's saying preaching and teaching was so important that it can be argued that this thing was all about preaching and teaching. Amen. In the power of the Holy Spirit, of course. No matter where they were, the apostles were preaching. Whether in public gatherings, whether in before politicians, in the synagogues, from house to house, they were boldly preaching Christ. When they measured their ministry success, in Acts chapter 6 verse 7, look at how success was measured. Acts 6 verse 7, can we read together, what does it say? The word, are you there? Acts 6 verse 7, let's read together. The word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase in Jerusalem greatly. Did you see that? What kept on increasing? The word of God, not the name of the apostles, right? The word of God kept on increasing. They felt guilty in Acts chapter 6 for neglecting the preaching of God's word, for doing good things. But they said, we can't continue doing other things. We must focus on the word and prayer. Even when they were faced with danger, they had to tell their enemies, we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. We cannot stop speaking. Amen. We got to speak this thing out. Amen. The authorities were worried that they have filled Jerusalem with their teachings. That's what it says in Acts. They were worried that the teachings of the apostles are now spreading in all of Jerusalem. Yes, they were doing other good works, but the major thing was the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. The true church is devoted to preaching and teaching. This is why we encourage you to always attend whenever we have an event. We are very intentional about this. We're not interested in entertaining you. We are interested in you being established in sound doctrine. Amen. This is what the early believers gave themselves, devoted themselves continually to the preaching and the teaching of the apostles. Motivational talks, sound bites, TikTok relationship advice is not enough to nourish you. You can't live off of that stuff. Can help you to become like Christ. You need to devote yourself, to give yourself to listening, to studying and applying the word of God. Listening, studying and applying the word of God. If you want to know if a church is a true church, check their commitment in teaching believers sound doctrine. Check their teaching in sound doctrine. Doctrine is what people need so that they grow. If all you hear about a church is encounter meetings and people coming for healings and for miracles so that the men of God can touch them, so that they can have one-time things that are just are going to help them for that time, but then they need to keep on coming and giving money. If that's all you hear about a church, then something is wrong. A true church devotes itself in the preaching and the teaching in sound doctrine. You'll forever remain a baby because others make you rely on them for things that you can learn yourself. If you are someone who relies a lot, 
who lives your Christian life by other people's devotions and not your own, you will continually remain a baby. Constantly needing to be fed milk instead of meat. We had a baby this past weekend. Um, and I was reminding you again of the time when our kids were young. And, and the baby needed to continually be fed milk and eat here because he can't stand for himself. He, he can't eat meat, he can't eat heavy things because he's young. There's a lot of believers. I wish I had brought a. He bought it, let me see. And I just began to suck upon it. You would, you would have laughed at me, eh? <laughs> so, imagine if you see me, and you see me sucking on this, right? And I'm sitting here and I'm busy too. What would you think? This, this, is, this is weird, right? You're a grown man. You shouldn't be drinking milk. You should be eating meat by now. But there's a lot of Christians that are living on milk. That are living on other people's relationship with God and not their own. And this is why the body of Christ is where it is. This is why false teaching has come into the house of the Lord. This is why we can't discern if something is false or right because we do not know the doctrine. We don't know the word of God. We don't know what is truth and what is right. We're not devoting ourselves to the teaching and preaching of the word of God. The mark of a true church is that they devote themselves continually to the preaching of the word of God. So you need to know doctrine. You need to know teaching. What does the word of God teach about ancestors? Have you ever thought about that? What does God's word say about ancestors, about parents? What does the word of God teach about relationships? What does the word of God teach about marriage? Where are you getting your teachings from? From TikTok? Who's giving you advice about relationships? Do you know that the Bible speaks about relationships? Do you know how the Bible expects a Christian to carry themselves within a relationship? You need teaching on that. You need to be established on that. What does the Bible teach about work? What does it teach about school? What does it teach about all the aspects that you need in your life? We need to know this so we can truly devolve, de de devote our lives to Christ. This was the obsession of the early church. As soon as they got saved, the Bible immediately, the next verse, they devoted themselves continually to the preaching and teaching of the apostles. Your maturity in Christ is linked to your growth and understanding and applying of the word of God. Let me say that again. Your maturity in Christ is linked to your understanding and your applying of the word of God. You cannot apply what you do not know. Pray for God to give you a desire to love and study his word. Oh, that it might be someone prayer this morning. Lord, Give me a love for your word, like the psalmist praying. I love your law. It is my meditation all day. Give me a love for your word. You know, when in, my, in our 20s, when we were still growing in the Lord and when we got saved, any time that they called something and any time that people were having something, we were there sitting and learning, taking notes. Because we realized that for us to grow, we needed to know what, what does this Bible say about my life. My life does not belong to me anymore. It now belongs to God. And so if I'm going to grow in God, I better make sure that I know what he thinks about what I should do. Isn't it? Otherwise, what happens is, you become a Christian, but you still respond in a way of your culture and not in the way of what the Bible says.
You know it's possible that you can be a Christian, but when you face major obstacles, guess how? If you're not trained in the word and in sound doctrine and establishing it, you will respond in the way that everyone who's not saved responds. It's possible if you have not renewed your mind and taught yourself for it. Linfila Modimo Liri saw, 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 saw when I'm facing death. This is the what the word of God says when I'm getting married. This is what the word of God says when I'm at work. This is what the word of God says when I'm a student. We need to train you so that you know how to respond. I'll give you a practical example of this. Experienced it the last few weeks with the conference that we had with Pastor Charlie. I remember sitting there with Pastor Charlie. Pastor Charlie made an example. He said, to show you that some of you do not believe in the power of Christ. He said, Epsu, why don't you go and wake up and go to the graves? Why, if there's a path of the graves that's closer that you can take, why won't you take that path? But you take a longer path because you don't want to pass through the graves. I'm asking women are easily. Or, or in, how many of you are there? No, let's be honest, Basavad. You will not pass through the graves, Epsu. Not because it's not, uh, not because it's a uh, Baso Baso who, you know, they'll mark you. Baso Chonchera. Not because it's unsafe, but because of what? Say it. What? You are fearful, right? But then it hit me. I, I was fearful. I said, I, I don't know why. I, I said, yeah, I wouldn't do that. But now, what does the Bible teach about those who are dead? What, what does the Bible teach? They are not there. And now I begin to ask, like, why am I fearful? Then you know what I realized? I am not established in the truth. I need to renew my mind to believe the truth about what it says about people in those graves. I should not be afraid to walk in the graves at night if I'm a Christian. Unless they will mark me, unless it's a case where it's not safe. I understand. But if I can pass through that, I should be able to pass there without any fear. If I know who I am in Christ. And so that's why we need to establish ourselves in doctrine. How many of you, when you are called upon in home to do certain ceremonies, it's shocking to see the decisions as Christians make. Yeah, I know, I don't know what the Bible says, so you know what, what I, you don't know how to behave with regards to that situation, what the Bible says. Why? You're not established in sound doctrine. You're not established in what the Bible teaches about that issue. If you're established, you are supposed to quote the word of God. You're supposed to stand on what you believe and say, the Bible says this and that, therefore it says it, I believe it, I will not do this and that. Amen. Amen. This is why we are obsessed, Mogar again, to expose you and to teach you and to establish you in sound doctrine. Not so that your head can be full, but so that you can listen to something and say, hmm, I know this, but I'm not walking in it. Why? Or if you don't know it, you say, wow, I didn't know that the Bible talks about how I should spend my time. The Bible actually talks about, has a view on entertainment. The Bible has a view on how you think. The Bible actually has something to say. We don't, we don't take that part and then now we say, I'm more, I'm just doing my thing. Uh, like some people say, it's very shocking. We talk to them and they say, hey, only people by pain, I'm full by pain. And I'm like, okay. Even I would be by pain, would part me. Because why? And I understand. Sometimes people can. I'm not talking about Bible bashing, where people can just bash you with verses. But I'm just talking about a desire and a habit of walking in the truth. A true church establishes people on sound doctrine in all areas of life. Did you see that? They devoted themselves continually to the apostles' teaching. So they are applying the gospel in all areas of life. And like the example I gave, is possible, it doesn't mean that because you are saved 15 or 20 years, therefore now, no, not sharp. 
Like I've heard some, some, some comedians saying, why don't you go to church? He says, no, I've gone to church. I started when I was three years, then I was an usher, then now, now I'm sharp, I'm okay with church. Because why? That person doesn't understand. It's not about how many years you're in church. There's still a lot of things that need to be renewed in your mind. Amen. There's still a lot of things that you are not, you are not even aware that the Bible speaks on it until you hear someone say, hey, are you walking in the gospel with regards to this issue? A quick practical example, again. Do you remember Peter and Paul? You remember Paul had to rebuke Peter. The same Peter who was preaching here. The same Peter who preached and 3,000 people got saved. Amen. Later on, there are specific, he's standing with Jews and then he sees certain Gentile believers are coming and then Peter withdraws himself. Paul sees him. Paul had to say, hey, what are you doing? Paul says, I had to rebuke him to his face. What you are doing, you're not walking in line with the gospel, right? So Peter was saved, but he was not renewed in the issue of being a racist, right? He was saved and still a racist. Yes, I said it. He was saved, but he was not walking in the light of the gospel to the specific issue of accepting people that are different from him. So what did he need to do? He needed to renew himself and understand that God has a plan for them too. Amen. Amen. So if Peter can get it wrong, what about you and me? How many areas are we walking in not in the light of the gospel? Amen. Secondly, how do you identify a sign of a true church? It's a life of devotion to fellowship. A life of devotion to fellowship. Did you pick up the emphasis of togetherness in the book of Acts? Did you pick it up? Go back, go back to our text. Pick up the emphasis of togetherness. They, verse 42, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to what? To fellowship. Everyone kept sense, feeling a sense of awe. Many wonders and signs were taking place with them. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Do you see the emphasis? They were together. They had all things in common. They were devoting themselves to fellowship. One of the worst things to come out of the lockdown is for believers to think that they can be isolated and not be in community and still live victorious lives. Lockdown made us to think that we can do it on our own. The current of the world is so strong that it will overpower you if you are not regularly in community. If you are not in community and you stay away from that, the current of the world will overpower you. Have you been to the beach? I've been to Devon. And I've stood there at the edge. I've looked at those waves coming. And sometimes a crazy thought will come. Mara, what will happen if you are not in the middle of the world? You are in the middle of the You know? And then I have to pull myself. I'm looking at them like no ways. I am not the first person to come and swim against the current and make it. I'm not going to make it, right? Those waves are too strong. They are too strong. The sea will swallow you. We have Christians staying away from fellowship because they think they swim their way in the world into the ocean. They are swimming their way thinking that I you are you're right. I'm going to make it. I'm badin. I don't need the church. The world will swallow you. We have Christians staying away because of this. It's not going to work. A true church is devoted to fellowship. A true church is devoted to fellowship. Believers actually care about one another. It's not just a meeting where I come to church, get what I want, and then I live my own life. Uh -uh. I had somebody tell me, I remember a couple of years back, they came to church and they started to live their own life and they got pregnant out of wedlock. And when we asked about that, 
They gave me a shocking response I'll never forget. They say, well, now, what are you doing in my life? What are you doing in my life? When I come to church, I come to worship my God. Because they think that church is an individual thing. They don't understand that as soon as you say, I'm part of a church, I'm part of a fellowship, do you know what you're doing? You are putting your whole life on the table. You're putting your whole self and you're saying, guys, check me out. Call me out. Help me so that I can become like Christ. Because we are on the same ship, right? Fellowship, right? We're going on the same direction. So we must be willing to be called out if we are not walking in line with the gospel. You and me are coming from different backgrounds, but when we come to a fellowship in Christ, we are one. We are one. I have some things here to share about fellowship. I'll, I'll just run through them quickly. What is really fellowship about? Because when we think of fellowship, we think of biscuits. We think of just a nice time where we're laughing and we just talk about anything. We don't understand the word koinonia, the word fellowship. Very, very deep word. So what do we share in when we say fellowship? What are we fellowshipping in? What are we sharing? Quickly, we share the same Lord Jesus. We share the same Lord Jesus. All of us are sinners. Jesus is our hero. We are not in competition about who's, who's the better Christian here. Right? We're all sinners and we are sharing the same Jesus. Two, we share the same love for God. We, say, we share the same love of God. We are God's beloved children. Three, we share the same guide for life. We share the same rule. When the Bible says something is wrong, all Christians say it's wrong. You don't get to be the only one that says, I, I know the Bible says this, but now I disagree with Paul. Four, we share the same desire to worship God. We all want to please God. Anytime you're with a person who wants to please self and not God, and they're not accountable to God, run. If you're not married, and you're with a person who's not accountable to God, they don't care about God, run, trouble. Five, we share the same struggles, right? Different situation, but the same struggle. Struggles to remain holy in an unholy world. Struggles to obey God. Struggles to love one another. Number six, we share the same victories. When one of us overcomes temptation, we celebrate. When one of us perseveres in a trial, it's a victory. When one of us chooses Jesus of our culture, we say, Amen. Right? Because we are in fellowship. We share the same joy of communicating the gospel. Amen. The same joy of sharing Jesus. We share it in fellowship. A true church is united not on the basis of family or material possessions. A true church is united on the basis of true fellowship in Christ. Amen. Three. What's the third sign of a true church? A life devoted to prayer. A life devoted to prayer. Acts 2 chapter 42 says they were continually devoting themselves to prayer. They were continually devoting themselves to prayer. Because of time... I am going to jump this point. I'm going to pick it up next week. Let's go to the fourth point. They were continually devoting themselves to the breaking of bread. They were continually devoting themselves to the breaking of bread. Matthew chapter 26 verse 17. Jesus starts the Last Supper where he's with his disciples and they're taking the bread and the wine and then he says, do this in remembrance of me. What's the purpose of the Lord's Supper that we'll celebrate this morning? Number one, to commemorate or to remember. To remember what happened. The Passover was instituted by God to be a memorial of his deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt to bondage. From Egypt bondage to Canaan. 
Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as a memorial of the deliverance of Christians from sin. He would give to those who would trust in him. What's the another purpose of the Lord's Supper? To anticipate. To anticipate. With the word, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it with you, with you in my Father's kingdom. He instructed them to partake of the Lord's Supper, saying, as often as you drink it, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So therefore, when we observe the Lord's Supper, it's in anticipation of Jesus' return. We are anticipating the return of Jesus. Lastly, to participate. To participate. To commemorate, to anticipate, but also to participate. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 together as we get ready to share the Lord's Supper together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We are celebrating the completed work of Christ as we focus on our unity and visibly proclaim that to the world. So the Lord's Supper is an act of proclamation, giving public testimony to the message of the gospel. But it also involves personal examination. Personal examination. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Let's start from verse 27. Are you there? Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in, <coughs> in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must what? Examine himself and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, verse 30, many among you are what? Weak and, and sick, and a number sleep. Why? They don't judge the body rightly. They partake of what we are about to partake and bring judgment upon themselves to the point where they are sick and they die because they do not discern the body right. Very serious. But if we judge ourselves rightly, verse 31, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, as we have come together now, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. So the situation that was happening in Corinth is that people when it was time for the Lord's Supper, and when it was time, Utiba hand out hand out this, it became disorderly. When people were even eating this for the wrong reasons, Paul says that when you do that, you bring judgment upon yourself. What kind of judgment? Not to hell, but judgment that you can die. Some people die. We don't know why they die because they don't judge this right. But also, you can be sick if you do not observe the Lord's Supper correctly. How? By examining yourself. By taking this serious. Thinking of the cost of what it cost Jesus to die for your sin. And repenting and coming to Jesus with your sin. Amen. 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 These are the four signs of a true church. Devoting yourself, number one, to? To what? To sound doctrine. Number two, a devotion to what? To fellowship. 
Number three, a devotion to what? Prayer. Prayer. And number four, a habit of what? Of breaking bread. And celebrating the Lord's Supper. Once you see these four signs, you know that you have the true church of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the preaching and teaching of the word. Lord, it's easy for us to start moving away from your word and believing that games and gimmicks will help people. But help us not to move away from the gospel. Keep us from playing church. Keep us from not believing in the sufficiency, in the fact that your Bible is enough and what you have said is enough. Keep us from making church a place where flesh entertains itself, where flesh just does what it wants. We pray that the church will be loved, respected, and that we will live lives that are worthy of the gospel. Like the true believers we see, what a joy it must have been to be part of that community, a community there was a new community, a different community from the world. May Lord, may you make us this community as TCL. Not perfect, but different. Different. As you have changed us from the inside out. And so we pray that we may also exhibit these four signs of a true church. That we may continually preach your word and be devoted to reading and studying. That we may continually be devoted to prayer that we may continually be devoted to fellowship. Lord, keep us from being alone. Keep us from thinking that we can make it alone. When we feel like not coming to church or not coming to Bible study, may you remind us, oh God, that it's worth it. It's worth it. It's for our own good. It's for our own salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Then you may distribute the wine. And the bread, Maria, Swang Maria, God.